Hello everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna be finishing off the modular filament drawer system. There's a few things left to do. I need to make and install the face plates. I need to make the drawer poles, and then I also need to make the labels for those. After all that's done, then we can get all the filament in here and we will be completely done with this. Also in this video, I'm gonna be kind of talking about the pros and cons, since this isn't the perfect solution for everyone. I'm also gonna be talking about some of the other options I looked into, because those actually might be better off for you. And then also kind of a final breakdown of the cost, things I learned and what I would change for next time. So let's dive right in and start making the faceplates. For the face plates, I'm using this leftover cover panel that I had from my kitchen remodel that I did last year. It was pretty much the perfect size and thickness that I needed for these face plates, so I'm just using my track saw to cut this down into strips. Each one of these strips is going to be oversized for about three face plates. So I'm going to take the strips, put them on the CNC router, and cut out the face plates. Of course, you don't need to use fancy material. You don't even have to have a face plate on there, and you don't need a CNC router. You could just rip down plywood on a table saw. That would be perfectly fine. As a YouTuber and a content creator, I just kind of feel the compulsion to overdo things and use as many tools as possible. There's basically three steps to making these face plates on the CNC router. The first one is to drill the holes, the second is to cut out the profile, and the third is to add the chamfer. For the first step, we first need to drill some mounting holes into the spoil board. We need a smaller hole than what's going to go through the face plate because we're going to be using these holes to mount down to the spoil board for the next step. I know that might sound kind of confusing, but we don't want to reference off of the stock or the workpiece. We actually want to reference off of the face plates that are contained within them. This will all make sense in a second. So we're drilling a smaller hole into the spoil board, and then we're going to put the workpiece back and then drill the larger hole through it, and now these two holes will line up. So now we can remove the stop blocks from the outside and now we have a nice consistent way to not only drill the holes, but also to hold them down for the next step. I think I forgot to hit record on actually drilling the holes through each one of these, but it was pretty straightforward. I just kind of keyed it off into the bottom left, hit go, drill the six holes, rinse and repeat. Now that we have these six holes in each one of these boards, we can screw them down to the spoil board and we know where those holes are located so everything is nice and indicated and we don't have to worry about locations on anything and most importantly we don't have any hold down clamps on the outside corners which is critical because we're going to be cutting all along the outside of this piece the hole size is actually relatively critical because i'm using an 832 to screw this down into each one of the modules and i want this to fit very 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 tightly if it was loose then i'd have to kind of align each one of the face plates and i don't want that so this is as tight as possible and of course we can use a screw to hold this down to the spoil board and it will keep it from shifting around or that's what it should be doing so I did a dumb and kind of screwed up a little bit. I didn't think this through thoroughly enough. MDF really isn't the best material to screw down into, especially with relatively small fasteners. I think these are only like a number six or number eight. So they're pretty small and they really don't have that much bite, especially into MDF. However, six of them for the full thing should totally be fine, right? Well, it is until you cut through the first one, then you don't have all the fasteners holding it down. You only have two fasteners holding down each face plate, and that definitely was not enough. There's just not enough friction to hold that in place, so they were kind of pivoting or shifting as I would uh, finish off that pass. Thankfully, nothing was really too ruined, and for future face plates, what I did is I modified the G-code to where it would leave just a tiny bit of onion skin on the bottom and then come in for one finish pass. And that last finish pass is cutting a lot less material, so it has a lot less load on it. And I also added just a tiny little piece of carpet tape on the underneath side just to kind of add that extra bit of friction to stop it from shifting around. 
you know, looking back in hindsight, maybe I should have done something different, but this is one of those things where I thought, oh, this is gonna be super, super easy. I'll just use the screw holes, but it just didn't end up working the way I thought. And also using this big half inch compression bit didn't do me any favors. There was a fair amount of load because I was going very quickly. And so, yeah, it kind of was shifting around more than I wanted it to. When I got down to the last final face plates, you can see that the edge quality really wasn't all that great. It was fine on the first couple batches, but then it got worse and worse. And it turns out there was just a lot of gunk building up on the end mill, and that was kind of creating this charring or burning, and the cut quality just really wasn't that great. I probably should have cleaned it off, adjusted the feeds and speeds, whatever, but I have to go and sand this surface anyway, since this is like a plywood type product, this doesn't leave a really nice smooth edge, so I've got to sand it anyway, so I just kind of ignored it and kept plugging along. The last and final step for these is to cut the little chamfer on the top. I definitely could have done this by hand, and I think if I did it over, I probably would have done this by hand, but I used the same process as before. Drill a couple holes in the spoil board, use those for mounting, mount it down, and then just run a really quick program. It takes a little bit of adjustment to kind of get that chamfer angle just right, and it was a little bit inconsistent because the ones that did shift a little bit obviously have a little bit different geometry, but it's really not that big of a deal. It's just kind of to break up that hard edge. The last piece that needs to be made are the actual drawer poles. This is what I came up with. There's obviously a lot of different options that you could use. It's a three inch center to center. This is made for an 832 tap. And this one has a little insert for a one inch by two inch label. I'm gonna be using my fiber laser to cut these, but any paper one inch by two inch label would work perfectly fine. So I'm gonna print a bunch of these out and we can start assembling everything. So this is where everything starts coming together and I start getting pretty excited about the final product. I'm just putting on the face plates. It has two 832 screws that kind of come in from the backside, go through the panel, and then into the drawer pole in the front. Pretty simple stuff. You might also notice that the edges look a lot nicer. Off camera, I sanded all these and it really didn't take that long. I was kind of worried about that, but it was pretty simple. I just took five of them, clamped them together, and then used a random orbit sander to just kind of sand the edge, flip it around, sand the other edge, move the clamps. It was really, really easy to do. I think the whole thing only took eh, maybe 15 minutes, so that really wasn't too bad. Using just these two screws for the faceplate and drawer pole means it's going to be a little bit wobbly, and that's because I tried to keep the drawer design as lightweight as possible, but there's four more screws that can go into the back to kind of stabilize everything, and it makes it feel a lot more solid. And the screw size is the same one that came with the drawer slides, so you can actually just use those screws, shoot them into the back, and it makes it a lot more secure, as you can see. So I'm going to go through and do that for all of the faceplates. So now that everything's assembled, it's time to gather up my filament, figure out what I have, organize it, and put it into the individual drawers. It might not look like it from this video, but I'm kind of sorting everything. So I'm putting like nylons in one spot, other carbon fiber blends in another spot. I got TPUs, PETGs, ABS, ASAs, and then all the PLAs. For the PLA, I'm kind of separating it out by kind of type. I've got like some tough PLA, some, you know, advanced PLA, and I've got my standard stuff. And then I have like the bamboo and the prushamint, which is kind of a little bit more of a premium, but I'm just kind of separating these all into stacks so I can get a better idea of how much I have of each kind. I'm loading this up and kind of shifting things around, seeing how I like it. Ultimately, I want my most used filaments kind of in the middle, and then the lesser used filaments in the corners where they're less accessible. And so I'm starting with the TPUs, carbon fibers, uh, PETG and ASA, 
because those I kind of don't use all that much. Those are going to be in the corner. Then I'm doing the most used PLAs in the middle and then kind of anything else specialty on the other side. And I made these temporary paper labels just to kind of see what everything looks like and see where everything would go. And then the next step, I'm going to make the final labels on the fiber laser. I'm using my fiber laser to cut the labels because I'm just looking for any excuse to use this thing. I really haven't used it that much since I got it. I'm cutting the labels out of these 0.6 millimeter thick aluminum business cards. The fiber laser can not only engrave the surface, but it can also cut them out. The downside is they're so thin that when the heat of the laser hits it, they tend to warp. So I had to 3D print this jig to kind of hold everything in place. I'll end up getting three full labels out of each one of these business cards. They're very cheap, readily accessible. You can get these on Amazon and they're kind of a really handy thing to have on hand. And this little jig, which is printed out of ASA because things get hot, just kind of holds everything in place while it gets engraved and cut. And it also stands it off of the surface of the laser because we're cutting through aluminum and that laser beam will go right through and just kind of dig into the bed. So holding it up a little bit just kind of helps from damaging the table of the machine. And this thing just sounds amazing when it's running. It's always very satisfying to hear it run. So I'll do that here in a second, let you hear what it sounds like when it's actually running. You might notice on the cut, those center little ribs kind of melted a little bit. They really weren't necessary. So I ended up cutting those off and it was perfectly fine. There's just a lot of heat concentrate right there. So yeah, that's what the process is. And let's hear what it sounds like. So then I went through and replaced the temporary paper labels with the new fiber cut aluminum labels. And it looks really, really sharp. Really happy with visually how this turned out, even though that's, you know, kind of not the point, but it looks really, really nice. And with that jig, I can go back and make more labels because I'm probably gonna expand some more on the bottom of this rack, but having that jig is really handy. It makes making more of these labels really, really easy. So this is what it looks like when it's fully complete and labeled. And I think it looks fantastic. I'm very happy with how this turned out. Also, I'm really happy with the idea of this organization because I have a lot of different types of filament and I like kind of approaching a project with, I need this type of filament, so what do I have on hand? So if I want to do something in prototyping with just standard colors, here's what I have for my standard colors. If I want something out of like a nylon carbon fiber blend, it's all right here, nice and easy. So I like that everything is organized and it's a relatively dense storage. There's about a hundred rolls of filament. And you saw earlier, I had a eight foot by three foot workbench completely full of filament. And that's what's in these drawers right now. So pretty awesome. I think the last and final thing to talk about is just kind of some observations that I've made through making this. In the previous video, I promised I'd talk about some of the costs, pros and cons. So let's get into that right now. So I'm gonna try and keep this as concise as I can. I can probably talk for hours on this subject, but pros and cons of the drawer system. The pros are kind of obvious. It's modular, it's flexible. You can make it as deep as you want. You can kind of make it in any configuration that you want. And being able to sort by filament type has been amazing. I love that concept. There are a lot of cons here. One, it's relatively expensive. It's open, so it's not sealed. Um, it takes a larger format printer to print. 
and you need to print this out of ABS or ASA. Um, PLA will not work, PETG won't work, and I really don't know of another filament that would work for this application. You're going to have to do ABS or ASA. They're nasty, they're toxic, they need an enclosure, so that is a bit of a downside, and the fact that you need a larger printer, that just is what it is. Um, other filaments are just not going to work for this application. In terms of cost, a lot of people are talking about this. The drawer slides are relatively expensive, but they're really expensive in singles. If you get like a five pack or a 10 pack, the cost goes way down. I'm sitting at about $35 per module, and that's not including the face plates because I already had that material on hand. But $35, about 15 of it is the drawer slides because I bought them in quantity. I bought a 10 pack and then a five pack for 14 plus one extra. So they're about $15 per drawer slide. It uses about a half a roll of filament. That's another $15, another $5 for the hardware and the PVC. Um, some people are talking about using like um, conduit. I don't think using metal is gonna gain you anything. The drawers are very sturdy. They're a lot more sturdy than you would expect once you add in all the hardware. So you're at 15 for the slides, 15 for the filament, five for the um, hardware. You can cut the filament cost down in half if you go with ABS. I wanted to go with ASA for reasons, um, but ABS is about half that cost. So factor that in. I am looking to do a smaller design that will actually print on a standard printer. It's probably gonna take me some time. That's gonna be a little bit challenging just due to the geometry, but I'm gonna definitely attempt that. So yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have to say about this. I absolutely love it. Um, I think this is great. And I think other people think so too. I was amazed um, when I looked today on printables.com. If you go to printables.com, click on 3D models, it's the fourth model on the trending, which is insane. I never really thought it'd be that popular. So I'm very, very, very happy about that. Um, but fun fact, this wasn't even meant for this spot. That's the weirdest thing is, and I didn't redesign it. I actually was building this for a different application. And at the last minute I was like, I wonder if it would fit in something like this. That's what gave me the idea to use this rack for my 3D printers as I measured it and found out that this would actually fit and that changed the whole thing. So the video about reconfiguring this shelving unit for 3D printers was because I was designing this for some other application and it ended up fitting perfectly in here. So kind of fun fact. But as always, thanks for watching. Uh, appreciate all the comments, appreciate all of the um, interest on printables. It's really cool to see it downloaded that many times and that many people building it. So really happy about that. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Bye.